نصيبي الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي خلق الخلق تفضلا واصطفى من عباده رسلا بعثهم مبشرين ومنذرين ليهلك من هلك عن بينة ويحيا من حي عن بينة وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمدا عبد الله ورسوله وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان وسلم تسليما كثيرا أبدا ودوما أما بعد We left off talking about how the Sahaba dealt with the Quran. The way they dealt with the Quran is what changed them from being the lowest, most neglected people of their time to being the leaders of the world. The climate back then wasn't much different than it is today. Their technology back then was not more advanced than it is today. They didn't have bionic implants, nor did they have superhuman strengths. What they had differently was their iman and submission. It was an, at an all-time peak, even before Islam was complete, and even while alcohol was still not prohibited. Imagine, just imagine that liquor was still being served, yet they had more iman, more submission to the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, more than we, the sober of today, have after alcohol was prohibited. They had the Quran, we have the same exact Quran, dot for dot, letter, letter for letter, and word for word. We took the words of the Quran. They took the words of the Quran and lived the reality and application of it. The Quran is now the most read book on the face of this earth. And at the same time, it's the least practiced book. The key to that is what I ended the last halaqa with. They learned the ayat, 10 ayat at a time. They wouldn't pass it until they learned the meaning, the tafsir. And then they put it into practice. Then they moved on. The students of the Messenger وسلم, recited, memorized, understood, contemplated, applied and put into practice. Today those categorized as the best stick to memorizing and reading the words. Or others who pick and choose what they want to apply. Illa man rahimallah. What's lacking today is application of what's read and memorized. And before that, of course, is understanding the ayat, the tafsir. The Quran changed the Sahaba and it'll change anyone who befriends it. Raise yourself and your children to memorize the Quran and with the same intensity to apply what they learn. Application becomes possible and easier after knowing the tafsir of the Quran. Memorizing alone is not enough. Some of the most notorious tawaqeet some of them don't have a problem with the people memorizing the Quran. In fact, some tawaqeet encourage it. Some tawaqeet sponsor and spend large sums of wealth to have Quran memorization competitions, voice competitions, qiraat competitions. They'll allow memorization schools for the Quran everywhere. But they won't allow application of it. They want their subjects Donkeys, like the parable mentioned in the Quran. Read and memorize the Quran, but you better not apply it. مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ حُمِّلُوا التَّوْرَاتَ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَحْمِلُوهَا كَمَثَلِ الْحِمَارِ يَحْمِلُ أَسْفَارًا 
The example of those who were entrusted and charged with the Torah but didn't fulfill it is like a donkey carrying books. They're compared to donkeys. Ibn al-Qayyim said, even though the example specified those who were given the Torah, it applies to, to those who were given the Quran, yet do not apply it nor give it its dutiful rights. A donkey doesn't benefit when carrying books on its back. Nor does a human who memorizes the Quran but doesn't apply it. When I was younger and I memorized the Quran, in Medina and we returned to the States. From what I recall, Wallahu alam, I was probably the only one at my age at that time who had memorized the Quran in the United States. They introduced me in several international conferences and gatherings just because of my age and that I had memorized the Quran. Now the Hufal of the Quran are in practically every other household. Thousands not only memorize the Quran, but can tell you the page number and the verse number. Instead of being acted upon, the ultimate goal has become competitions on memorizing the Quran, the words of the Quran, and the beautification of the voices. The Quran became a book for them to apply the musical patterns, the maqamat, so disrespectful to the word of Allah, so out of hand that even recently a famous reciter got carried away making like a hip dance move while reciting with the maqamat in a funeral. This is not to diminish or discourage memorizing the Quran. I've encouraged not only memorizing the Quran, but beyond that, the mutun in ahadith. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward my parents for the enormous effort they put into getting us to memorize the Quran. But memorizing words without understanding and contemplating and application is why the ummah is where it's at today. Someone memorizes and that's all they want out of it. Others are selective in what they choose from the book of Allah. When it's Ramadan, people see a child fasting, they say, Allahumma barik law, so cute, he's fasting. Because Allah said, kutiba alaykum siyamu. But then they see a cub raised by lions and lioness who fully understand a similar command. Kutiba alaykum al wa huwa kurhun lakum. People despise that cub, his parents, those who raised him on that pure path, and everyone on that path. Allah said, وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا الزِّينَةِ Allah said, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِنَّمَا الْخَمْرُ وَالْمَيْسِرُ وَالْأَنْصَابُ وَالْأَزْلَامُ رِجْسٌ مِّنْ عَمَلِ الشَّيْطَانِ فَاجْتَنِبُوهُ Don't go near zina. Don't drink. Don't gamble. People take those commands seriously. And if many people do, if they were to fall in any of them, they'll most likely admit their mistake and sin. And sometimes many do repent. But then they'll reject the meaning of Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu la tattakhidhu al-yahuda wa al-nasara awliya ba'duhum awliya ba'd. Don't take the kuffar as your awliya. The one who ordered siyam ordered qital. The one who ordered to stay away from alcohol and zina and gambling ordered one not to have wala to the kuffar. The ayat of wala and bara must be understood in the same intensity as the ayat ordering salah and other commands of Allah. They're all from al-alim al-khabir. Some are selective in what they choose. Others abandon all the commands altogether. And some of the brothers on the pure Tawheed, inshallah, also need to realize the importance of the Quran. 
They may practice it, believe in the commands, apparently. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what's in the hearts. But some neglect recitation, memorization, and truly befriending the Quran. That's one of the main reasons why some fail when tests and trials come. Lack of recitation, lack of attachment to the Quran will cause one to fail at the first test. When some are tested with trials or defeats or prisons, the niqabs are sufur, the beards are shaven and trim, the hair is qaza, words of kufr and regret are uttered. Why didn't Allah give us victory? Why did Allah do this to us? They didn't properly get the true tafsir of the Quran. They didn't have a bond with that Quran. أَمْ حَسِبْتُمْ أَنْ تُتْرَكُوا وَلَمَّا يَعْلَمِ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا مِنْكُمْ وَلَمْ يَتَّخِذُوا مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ وَلَا رَسُولِهِ وَلَا الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَلِيْجَةً وَاللَّهُ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ In Surah Al-Ahzab, the best men, Zulzilu, Zilzalan Shadeedah. The Sahaba, Rasulullah was with them. They were tried and shaken with a mighty shaken. هُنَالِكَ بَتُلِيَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَزُلْزِلُوا زِلْزَالًا شَدِيدًا When you're attached to the Qur'an, you read those verses and understand what happened in Al-Ahzab and contemplate. If this happened to Rasulullah and the Sahaba, the same may happen and will happen to us. Let me prep myself internally so when trials come up remain steadfast مَسَّتْهُمُ الْبَأْسَاءُ وَالضَّرَّاءُ وَالزُّلْ زِلُوا حَتَّى يَقُولَ الرَّسُولُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مَعَهُ مَتَى نَصُوا اللَّهُ You hear statements like why would وَالْعِيَاذُ بِاللَّهِ Why would Allah allow them or us to be massacred like that if they or us are on the haqq Almost everyone memorizes Surat Al-Buruj. But how many pay attention to the tafsir and contemplate to present day situations what happened to the people of Al-Akhdud? They turn away from the path of Tawheed thinking they're on this earth testing Allah Billah, instead of the opposite. If it was constant victories and miracles, like I've always said, who wouldn't be on the path of Tawheed? Haqq and Batil collide. This dunya is a test. A generation comes, they need to be tested. Who's with the Haqq? Who's with the Batil? فَلَيَعْلَمَنَّ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ صَدَقُوا وَلَيَعْلَمَنَّ الْكَاذِبِينَ They get their grade, they pass and move on. No generation comes, they need to be tested. Where do we get this? From the Quran. لِيَمِيزَ اللَّهُ الْخَبِيثَ مِنَ الطَّيِّبِ And the many similar verses like that. Some people who may be apparently on the haqq and follow the Quran apparently don't have, some don't have private nightly sessions with recitation, memorization, understanding and contemplating the word of Allah. And that is one of the biggest of several reasons why some fail when they're tested. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in his book, فَمَنْ تَبِعَ هُدَايَ فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ He said, فَمَنْ تَبِعَ هُدَايَ فَلَا يَضِلُّ وَلَا يَشْقَى Attaching yourself and your heart to this book means no fear over the future, no fear over what's to come, and no sadness over what had passed. Did the Sahaba render on their heels radiallahu anhum ajma'een at the calamity of Uhud? Did they say we were radicals before Uhud? Now we're reformed and we realize the path we're on was wrong? Did they say let us go to Rustum and Kisra and Quraysh and help them out? Let us go to the youth of Quraysh and tell them not to join the path we're on? We're going to open think tanks and help Quraysh against Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
They, they sit and weep over that calamity for years and decades. They accepted it from Allah. They analyzed the situation so they can learn from their mistakes. They remained steadfast, firm, and moved on to leave the globe. Because they learned 10 ayat, and didn't pass them until they fully understood their tafsir and applied them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised to guard his book. We set down the Quran and we will guard it. In another verse, the wisdom behind the revelation. It was revealed so you can deeply think and contemplate and ponder and reflect over the verses. The Qurtubi said this is proof that it's wajib to know the tafsir of the Quran. At Tabari said it means one must contemplate and act upon the verses. Allah promised to protect the Quran. Allah ordered to understand and apply it. Allah promised to protect the Quran. He ordered to understand and apply it. Allah promised to protect the Quran. And He ordered us to understand it and apply it. People focused and made it their only goal what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised and neglected what they were ordered. Exactly like what Al Hassan al Basri said as he was quoted in Talbis Iblis. The Quran was meant to be put into practice and acted upon. People selected recitation of the Quran as the only required deed. Understanding and contemplating the Quran is not just memorizing its letters and not applying its commands and knowing its limits. Some brag about how many times they read the Quran. But you don't see any of that in their aqidah. You don't see any of that in their manners. You don't see any of that in their actions. The people before us saw the Quran as a message from Allah to them. They contemplated it during the night to apply it day and night. Allah emphasized to follow the Quran in the Quran. What La ilaha illa huwa wa a'rid anil mushrikeen. Follow, 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 follow. Allah vilified Bani Israel. Wa minhum ummiyuna la ya'lamuna al-kitaba illa amaniyya wa inhum illa yazunnun. Among them, the people of Bani Israel, those who are illiterate, who know nothing about the scripture, illa amani. What they know about the scripture, illa amani. Illa amani, we go to the tafsir. Means they only know the recitation of it. They were condemned and vilified for only knowing the recitation, not the meaning, nor acting upon it. Look at the examples. And there's numerous examples on the submission the Salaf had to the commands of the Quran. When Aisha radiallahu anha was falsely slandered, among those who spread the slander against her was a relative. Not only a relative, but a man, his name was Mistah ibn Uthatha. He was a poor man who was not only a relative of Abu Bakr radiallahu an, but Abu Bakr radiallahu an used to financially support him. After Allah revealed the verses, clearing our mother radiallahu anha, proving her innocence, Abu Bakr said, Wallahi la unfiqu ala mistahin shay'an abadab. 
By Allah, I will not give charity to Mustah anymore. After what he said about Aisha. Then Allah revealed a verse in the Quran. Let not those who are righteous good amongst you and those who have wealth, let them not stop giving those who are needy. Let them pardon and forgive. Do you not want that Allah forgives you? Imagine the hurt in Abu Bakr's heart. A relative who's supposed to stick by his side. Someone he financially supports. He slanders his flesh and blood in the worst of slander. A fresh wound in the heart of a Siddiq radiallahu an. But Allah said, وَلْيَعْفُوا وَلْيَصْفَحُوا أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورُ الرحيم. Let them pardon and forgive. Do you not want Allah to forgive you? They took the words of Allah seriously over their desires and wishes, over their children, over their wealth, over their honor, over their blood. Abu Bakr replied, Bala, Wallahi inni uhibbu an yaghfir Allahu li. Bala, Wallahi inni uhibbu an yaghfir Allahu li. Abu Bakr said, Yes, indeed, I want Allah to forgive me. And he resumed giving Nistah, the aid he used to give him. And he gave an oath that he will not stop giving him after that. Abu Bakr was hurt, radiallahu an, hurt beyond hurt, betrayed, an ultimate betrayal. But Allah said, Submission to the word of Allah. Understanding the word of Allah, contemplating the word of Allah, and blindly submitting and ap applying the word of Allah. When the delegate, Waft Bani Tamim, came to the Messenger, وسلم, Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhuma, had a dispute of who they wanted to choose as the, uh, the, the chief for that tribe. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu named someone, and Umar named someone radiallahu anhu. Abu Bakr and Umar had a slight argument over it. And Abu Bakr told Umar radiallahu anhu, all you wanted to do was oppose me. Umar said, I, I didn't intentionally oppose you. I didn't mean to, basically. Their voices grew louder in front of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and Allah reveals, the verse, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا تَرْفَعُوا أَصْوَاتَكُمْ فَوْقَ صَوْتِ النَّبِيِّ O you who believe, do not raise your voice over the voice of the Messenger wasallam. Look how seriously they understood that command and how they applied it. From that day on, after that command was re revealed, when Umar radiallahu anh, would speak to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa he would talk in a whispering tone. He would talk like he's whispering a secret to the point the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa would have to ask him at times to repeat what he's saying because he didn't hear him. The addiction of alcohol and liquor and how they submitted to its prohibition without any hesitation while they were drinking. All it, was to, all it took was a word, not even from the Messenger وسلم, directly, but from the Messenger's Messenger. Anas ibn Malik said, I was serving alcohol to Abu Ubaidah and Abu Talha and Abu Ubay bin Ka'ab. And someone passed by saying, liquor's been prohibited. On 
the spa with absolutely no hesitation, with full submission, with no hesitation. Abu Talha tells Anas, get up and break the pitcher that has the alcohol, the liquor in it. With no hesitation, Anas radiallahu anh says, I stood up and took a pointed stone and I hit and struck the pitcher at the bottom until it broke into pieces. Fajarat fi sikak al Madina. Liquor flowed in the streets of Medina. Ibn Hajar in another narration said, they didn't question the messenger that came by telling them this, nor did they hesitate. Aisha radiallahu anha said, يَرْحَمُ اللَّهُ نِسَاءَ الْمُهَاجِرَاتِ الْأُوَلِ لَمَّا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ وَلْيَضْرِبْنَ بِخُمُرِهِنَّ عَلَى جُيُوبِهِنَّ شَقَقَّنَّ مُرُوطَهُنَّ فَاخْتَمَرْنَ بِهَا When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to draw their veils over جيوبهن which is their faces and necks and, and bodies they tore the outer garments and made veils from them. The examples of their submission to the verses and commands of Allah in the Quran are many. They're narrated to us in the utmost details, but we don't see the slightest detail of resistance or doubts or hesitation or objection. With something newly legislated. It's not like something they were used to or knew about. All we see is absolute blind submission and obedience to the verses in the Quran and the orders of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa The earlier generation understood the reality of the Quran and its purpose and they fully implemented it. And that's what changed them. They understood that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala legislates what He wills, how He wills, and He legislates what's absolutely the best of the best for us. They understood it was their duty to completely and fully submit to Allah. They understood that submission to the words and commands of Allah in the Quran was the soul of Islam, and they were distinct and unique and unmatched in that. They radiallahu anhum ajma'in succeeded in being rewarded and granted the ridwan of Allah in dunya and akhirah. They were established on this earth as its leaders and attained the ultimate success in the akhirah. Insha'Allah next week we'll start on the actual tafsir of Surah Al-Fatiha. Jazakumullahu khayra. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم